Watcher of the Skies was a very important track to us, and although I think Tony was the sort of lead writer uh, on that, with you know, particularly the um, uh, Mellotron chords, and um, and I did some work I think on the on the verses and chorus, but the the vibe was um, uh, sci-fi meets prog, I think. Seems funny to say it now, but I, you know, I was still going to see Yes every Wednesday at the Marquee and still trying to bring a little bit of that musicianship into the band, that they kind of the tricky arrangements that they used to have. And I used to, so, so it's a shame we can't do stuff like that. So I think Watch of the Skies ended up, certainly the intro is all Tony, of course, but that's a da 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 You know, that was kind of probably came from somewhere near my drum end. Walking across the sitting room, I turn the television off. We always started each album, I did, with a degree of trepidation and excitement. A bit like, well, this is the new one, let's see what we've got here, but I don't know, a bit like, will it be good, will it work, you know? Um, but I think albums in Mama City alternate. Instagram, I think, was a bit hard to write for me. Foxtrot was easy. I think we're writing better together as a group. I mean, a lot of the stuff, individual you know, stuff, was still there. Um, you know, uh, you, you come into the group. I mean, I tend to remember on this album, you come in with ideas, a riff or something. And like I mentioned, the beginning of Supper's Ready, but also that applies to, you know, what became the end section of Supper's Ready. It was another thing I'd written. In fact, the thing I'd written on guitar at university, as it turned out, the as Sure as Eggs is Eggs thing. And so you had these sort of quite specific bits, like Willow Farm was Peters and things, and we had these quite big just chunks that were all written by people. We kind of put them all in the same song, and then it was the kind of filling out stuff that almost ended up being the strongest stuff, though, you know, like the Apocalypse part, which was something that really was Mike, um, Phil and I just wrote, you know, wrote that improvising, working out a big keyboard solo together and, and the sort of way of playing it. I think Supper's Ready was, again, one of these journey songs where we really tried to take people into the, along this dream um, dr dream journey. And uh, um, when it worked and we got to the sort of New Jerusalem stuff at the end, you could really feel people, uh, you were touching people um, in a quite a deep way. We weren't quite sure what we'd written really until we heard it back because we'd sort of had this long thing. We decided we were really going to go for the long one this time because we'd done musical box and stagnation. You know, so, well let's just go for a go for one whole side of an album, you know, 26 minutes. And 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 see what we can do. And we got these ideas and we actually sort of put bits and pieces in this the thing. I mean this song had started off just like just like stagnation really in a way. I had this guitar piece I'd written which um, we sort of I thought was a really strong opening part, you know, which was kind of first two or three minutes of the song was based on this this part and um, and we started doing a thing on it and got the sort of melody and it was sounding really good and we're carrying on and it was developing you know, in little tinkly bits after that and all the rest of it and a few vocal bits and I thought that if we do this could just be ending up sounding exactly like musical box we're not careful you know so I said well let's let's just stop the song that you know just we had a really romantic but I said let's just stop the song now and go straight into this other piece we have which is Willow Farm which is the thing that Peter had written so let's just go in there you've got this really pretty bit and it's really ugly chord sequence suddenly coming in after that should sound great and so we did that and then when we that suddenly took the whole song to another dimension you know suddenly the drums were in everything was going and the second half of the song becomes very electric and you know and I think produced what was our best piece of composition during the uh, the the period with Peter, which was the, the latter part of Supper's Ready, particularly from the, the Apocalypse in 9-8 onwards. It was just, uh, and it was a coincidence to some extent what happened there again. It was another of those places where I'd, I had this, uh, a keyboard solo and it ended on these big chords, and I thought, yeah, just big chords, you know. And I had this idea of just sort of vocal harmonies going, ah, you know. And, and then again, Peter started singing on top of it, you know. And, and I thought, oh, shit, here he goes again, you know. And I thought, and I heard it back, it really didn't take me very long this time. I thought, that sounds fantastic. And, and, and it was really was the, the real peak, you know, you sort of had this long build up with this um, keyboard solo, uh, which sort of like starts very sweet and then gets slightly more sinister. And then it's suddenly this big chord comes in and then 666 six, six comes in like that. Incredibly strong moment, I think. The, the big stuff on Supper's really like the big instrumental stuff. 
I, you know, I remember we were rehearsing at Una Billings School of Dance in Shepherd's Bush, and I had something to do in the afternoon. And I came back, and Mike and Tony had written basically the apocalypse in 9 8, you know, and that's what it ended up being called. This was just this riff don't, 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 don't. And I said, Ah, oh, sounds good. And um, Tony had written, not thinking about the time signature, he'd sort of written this keyboard thing, and actually the thing was in 9 8. So I, pl I maybe played it once or twice, but never really thought about it too much. And of course, we went in to record it, still not really knowing what it was, but it was just like one of those moments where the tape was playing and recording, and, and it was just captured. You know, that's one of our best, probably one of our best um, spontaneous moments. <laughs> functioned like the introduction to Supper's Ready because um, it just went straight into Supper's Ready so people just assumed it was part of Supper's Ready that's that's fine but it was it was at one minute 30 seconds of me coming up with something that was based on a on a Bach prelude I think it was for, for, for cello um, and I was amazed that, that, that the guys let me put it on the album to be honest um, I remember playing it to them in rehearsal one day and Phil said it sounds like there ought to be applause at the end of it. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, thank you, Phil, for that, you know, because otherwise perhaps it wouldn't have made it onto the album. I used to wear this uh, UV makeup and bat wings, but it would start the show and in darkness, you know, you'd, and then the UV lights would slowly come on and these big, droning chords would appear out of nowhere and then you'd see these two little points of light uh, um, which would be the eyes lit up um, and we had a white back cloth at that time. Well Peter had started you know um, as I said before really trying to find things to do on stage and just developed into wearing these kind of um, you know the masks and everything which on supper's ready worked really well I mean the, the flower idea was you know at the time it seemed a bit crass but the, it just worked so well you know as I said it's happened to that point I was talking about in supper's ready where the music went from pretty to, to silly you know and, and he put you just sort of suddenly said a flower and stuck this thing on his face and it just it was it was a great great musical moment a flower if you go down to Willow Farm. Paul Conroy you know who was working with us as an agent and um, and apparently I think Glenn Colson were talking about ways of trying to market this record and I think Paul got got the music but it wasn't really Glenn's cover tea at all but um, when they saw the uh, cover and saw this fox character they thought oh maybe we should you know pay someone a, a few quid and to uh, have them wear a fox head and and then I thought well Actually, if we're going to do that, I should try doing that. Um, so I took a red dress uh, from my wife's wardrobe. Was an, uh, she told me since it was an Aussie Clark dress, it would probably be worth quite a lot now. But And um, I could just about get into it. Um, I put the fox head on, and the first gig was actually in this old boxing ring in Dublin, which while now being a very progressive, tolerant, open city at that point, <laughs> there was a shocked silence when I walked out on stage, um, seeing a man in a, in a dress and in a sort of uh, animal head um, was, there was, yeah, a, a visceral sense of shock that you could feel, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. We'll, do that a bit more. <laughs> Pete probably very clearly realised that if, if, if he tried to run it by the band and get a committee vote on it, we'd all have said, you've got to be kidding, you know. Uh, so he cleverly appeared on stage with a red dress and a fox's head. Um, and we all kind of just went, wow. There was a, a ton of arguments about it, you know. And I thought, fuck it, I'm just going to do it. <laughs> um, you know, because we were always doing this sort of band democracy stuff. And actually, it wasn't a real democracy because some people were more powerful than others and um, the more bloody minded of us tended to get their uh, get their way more often and as it is in every band the world over 
we realized, you know, I mean, that, the, the, the story is that, you know, we did it and we weren't sure about it. We, we, we were happy enough with it in a way, but the next week we, he was on the front page of Melody Makers. We thought, ah, oh, this is interesting. And at that point, the band said, oh, maybe Peter has something. <laughs> uh, perhaps we shouldn't fight him on all of this, because they, they definitely got front page good. <laughs> 